He said, well, they're calling it hee-haw. I said, they're calling what hee-haw? Welcome to Hee Haw, starring Buck Owens and Roy Clark. <laughs> Looking back on it now, what could have been better? I mean, Hee Haw says it all. Videotape was just about uh, going strong then, just getting started. So I knew all of the production elements. So I was able to put that all together and became the associate producer of the uh, Jonathan Wynn series. Ran into and, and became friendly with a couple of writers, creators, and so forth, uh, John Ellsworth and Frank Pepiot. And uh, they were writers for the show, and of course we were all then one big family, we were all producing together and so forth. And uh, I noticed that the show wasn't rating well in the South. So I started a book, Certain Country People. One of it was Roy Clark, Buck Owens, George Goober Lindsay, Minnie Pearl, and Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And when you think about it, four out of the five became regulars on Hee Haw. And I noticed that the ratings were going up. We made a decision that maybe we ought to entertain a show that would be with music and quick cut one-liners like laughing. The, um, the producers of the Jonathan Winter Show came to me and asked me if I would be interested in this idea that they had uh, to do a comedy musical comedy show, not unlike Laugh-In. To me, it's like the triple threat, threat guy in football, run, pass, and kick. And Roy could play comedy and sing. He was the first person that we went after when the creation of Hee Haw got started. Buck really made a contribution to Hee Haw because of his music and, of course, of his recording. Um, uh, he wasn't really a, a, a comic. He, his comedy was not the best. But I knew how to use him musically and in certain parts. He was a good setup man. So it worked. The combination of the two was just a beautiful relationship. And then from that, the pieces started to fall. You know, Archie Campbell came in from the Grand Ole Opry, Minnie Pearl from the Grand Ole Opry, Grandpa Jones from the Grand Ole Opry. And it didn't take long. Everybody in creation that was in country music wanted it on the show. Uh, incidentally, uh, including the band, I had 52 people on the show. 52 people. It was supposed to have been a one-hour special on CBS just to see uh, what the reaction would be. Because there was discussions going on, and Jonathan had been canceled, about this he show, and there were things, indicators were such that country music was making its movement, we got a call from Mr. Perry Lafferty, who I worked with and for when I was at CBS. Remember, I was still a part of the network. And he said to me, Lavello, where is Pepe and Ellsworth? Go get them, because you need to get to Nashville in a hurry. And that was the summer that uh, the Smothers Brothers and CBS had their falling out, which left CBS with a summer slot. So they called us all into Nashville, met most of them for the first time. Some of the old timers I had worked with and loved forever, Grandpa Jones and String Bean and Archie Campbell. And within two weeks, within two weeks, we had to start delivering shows. And so we made our first telecast on June the 15th, 1969, the summer of 1969. We go to Nashville to shoot it, and they shot the show, and he and I were both really sick after we did the first show because it was against everything that we had tried to get away from. The bales of hay, the corn stalks, the, 
the, the, the, in the overhauls and stuff like that. Finally, I don't know how long we've been in production, uh, they put together a rough cut. I guess the producers said, we better show them something because they look like they're getting restless. Well, when they put it up on the screen and we watched, we didn't watch 15 minutes, 10 minutes. And then we said, so that's what they're doing. Now it made sense. You know, that one thing over here, and then it went right to something else. No continuity at all. And that's really what made it. You know, they say he's 94. Never looked at a girl in his life. Never smoked, took a drink, or gambled. Beats me why he wanted to live so long. <laughs> I hate my mother-in-law. Well, if it wasn't for your mother-in-law, you wouldn't have your wife. That's another reason I hate her. The first two shows didn't work. One of my associates came to me. He said, the critics are running this show down. It is so bad that the people are going to look at this show as a result of what the critics are saying. Is it all that bad? And that was the turning point. Because the people were reading what the critics were saying, tuned into us and said, hey, it's a great show. It's a family show. And the ratings went whoop, went right up. CBS or the world wasn't ready. The next thing you know, the ratings went through the roof. What we didn't realize that the magic to that show was really in the editing, in the fast clips, and in the comedy. It wasn't a country music show. It was a show that had country music in it, but it was a comedy show. We created a new style of doing a television show. But the bits and pieces was something that we fell into because we didn't have time to set up one set and go to the next thing and do a show by show by show. So the pressure was put on us to go into the editing room and assemble it and put it together. Nobody knew what we were doing. Everything was on cue cards. We, did, we never rehearsed, which is pretty obvious when you watch the show. And uh, we just come in and look at the cue card and read it. If we blew it, made a mistake, just uh, do it again. And a lot, of the, a lot of the mistakes made the show instead of what they were trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I do believe that that Marvin Muff Knuckles is the laziest one man that I personally have ever seen in my entire life. What do you think? I know it is that he is. And if he ever wakes up over twice a week, he complained of in snorting them. And... <laughs> it was down to a science in that I would get the guest artists first, get all their music out of the way. Then the next one in line would be Buck Owens, get his music out of the way. Then I would bring in everybody for comedy. Now Roy would be there now when we would do the comedy because the very first thing that when we did comedy was picking and grinning with Buck. And once we got through with picking and, picking and grinning, Buck would go home, and it would be comedy with Roy and with the rest of the people. And at the back end, I would do Roy's music. So that's the way I would you know, finish uh, the style of this production. We would just film twice a year, so around October and then again around June. We, we could shoot everything so quickly. Like they would take my Nurse Good Body spot, for instance, and do all 13 of them in one day. We would do a body of sketches, like say, uh, we do 13 shows at a time, and then 13 reruns. So we do 13 cornfields back to back, and then they would, they'd, they'd all be edited in California after we finish. But so each set, like 13 barber shops back to back. A small studio, a few people in there, like an audience, and uh, we proceeded to do not just one show, but. Um, I think it was 18 shows all together. And so we did, uh, you know, all those cornfield shots together, all the fence shots together, all Buck songs together, all the cast songs together, all Roy songs together. So it was really an interesting process. If the show was done on the clock, one hour at a time, it would never work. 
I crossed an anteater with an elephant. What'd you get? I don't know, but it sure has a sinus problem. <laughs> a big part of the show was, was the girls. Did you hear about the neurotic bloodhound? No! What happened? He thought people were following him. <laughs> no. Very smart, and they knew what their role was. You know, because they, Linda Thompson says it best, they were the backdrop. So the men could have the funny lines and do the real comedy, and they were this languishing backdrop in the back. But after a while, they really um, came to the front. And you look at people like Ganilla Hutton, who had nursed Goodbody for 20 years, her own sketch. You know, Misty had her own sketch. Linda had her own sketch. So eventually, they really were able to show the producers and the show, look, we have a lot more to offer than you know, the eye candy that we present. And I think it was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty amazing on their part. They were beautiful. And you know, God's work is, can be very beautiful. In fact, I've run into people all the time now so the only reason I watched Hee Haw was to see the pretty girls. I said, I got one up on you. I knew that coming in. Why do you think I was on there? <laughs> Roy asked me if I'd pose for him in a bikini. Of course you told him you're not a model. Of course, but he said that doesn't matter because he's not an artist. <laughs> With you. Yeah. Are you spitting in that pot over there on this no. afternoon? No. But I was coming pretty close to it. <laughs> we had talented people from all over that, uh, and none more talented than Gaylord, Gaylord Sartain. Jim Halsey, who uh, was Roy Clark's manager, had seen the old Mazeppa show at Channel 6, and he came by one day and said, uh, How would you like to be on Hee Haw? And I said, Well, I don't know, it's pretty corny. And, you, know, it's, you know, oh no, I'm, I'll just do what's up. And then I said, uh, what kind of money could a fellow make on it? He says, well, let's see, it's after, a, it's after scale is, I think, 600 a show. And I, <laughs> you know, I passed out. And when I was revived, I, I signed up. <laughs> you all know Gaylord, he's from Tulsa. He's going to do things his way, and he's going to rattle and throw everybody off balance. A Gaylord Sartain, mm, what a talent. What a wonderful guy. I just fell in love with him. I just went, uh, because he was funny, and he had timing. It was perfect. Gaylord, he's, he's nuts in a wonderful way. He is out there. He is not afraid of anything. He's one of the funniest people in the world and he's so talented but he would keep us laughing between takes some sometimes kind of naughty not like we didn't mind that so we would laugh and laugh and laugh his talent took over you know he could do everything and anything that's a good thing about hauling a load of furniture good buddy at least i'll have a place to live for a couple of weeks while i'm looking for a parking spot don't you know I always liked it when everybody was together. So I would love picking and grinning because I loved the camaraderie. That was my favorite part of the show was the camaraderie. I liked the family feeling. That made you feel good. And Sam, he was like a daddy. It was a crazy set because, you know, as long as we were on, it was like a huge family. And uh, we were all very close. I mean, we'd really be excited to see each other. Every time we came in, in June, we hadn't seen each other since the previous uh, October. And so it was like, hey, we could see uh, how everybody, how much weight everybody had gained, and learn all the babies' names. Hee Haw was an American icon that was a family that our own families all grew up with. And, and that's, that's cool. If you think about Hee Haw and you think about one word, family would have to be in. <laughs> My wife's cooking makes me so emotional. Every time I eat her mashed potatoes, I get a lump in my throat. Blame it all on my roots. I showed up in boots. Ruined your black tie. You know, Hee Haw was built around guest stars. All of the big stars, Alan Jackson, uh, Jackson uh, Randy Travis, um, Garth Brooks, Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette, 
George Jones, well, you just name them. They all did hee-haw. And to a lot of them, it was the first national exposure that they got. I got to do the cornfield twice. I got to do it with Grandpa once. And uh, Grandpa called me Clint. Everyone was calling me Clint Black at that time. Everyone was calling everybody Clint at that time. <laughs> you know, Clint. <laughs> but Grandpa, you know what? He's one of those guys that he can call you, he can call you any name in the book and you still look at him and just love him to death. Just sweet man. And that's, he, that's who he was. And that's, you know, Sam gathered those kind of people. Everybody on there was sweet. So this is what Hee Haw did. They were tongue in cheek, yes, but they took their business very seriously and what they hung their hat on, guys like Roy Clark, Buck Owens, Charlie McCoy, Sam Lovello, what they hung their hat on was the top list of artists of entertainment in country music. And uh, um, I, I felt very lucky to be on that show, not only for its national exposure, but just to be on a show that, that treated country music in such high respect as that show did. <laughs> you know, Nurse Goodbody asked me if my eyes had ever been checked. I told her no. They've been blue all my life. <laughs> Reba uh, was really introduced to me by Tom T. Hall. And I put her on, and she was good. I really honestly think she deserves to go into the Hall of Fame. Johnny, I've always been puzzled about this. Why is it easier to steal second base than it is to steal third base? Oh, well, sure, that's simple. There's a shortstop between second and third. Uh, a short stop. Oh. Uh -huh. And Johnny Bench, uh, I think that the reason for that was uh, that they wanted to get into the cornfield and they wanted to get in with the hee-haw honeys and stuff like that. Uh, and they, they were fun to be with. We were so grateful. That was such a big deal for us. Uh, to this day, people back in Texas and Oklahoma still remember, man, I remember when you guys were on Hee Haw. I remember when you guys were on Hee Haw and, and Butch dressed up as Lisa Todd, the weather girl, and I was Charlie Farkas and the news guy. That was a hoot. It was a, it was a great experience to work with Buck and Roy and, and uh, all, all, those, all those folks. Hee Haw. It was a, I was very excited to do Hee Haw because, you know, we watched it as I was growing up. I mean, we never... Never missed Hee Haw. I mean, it, it, you know, to the exclusion of just about everything else, we'd make sure we watched Hee Haw, you know. And so uh, I was real excited to do it. Well, that was, that was a fun time. Most of the time, they made sure that people interacted together. And they felt that that was important to know that the uh, hosts, et cetera, knew their guests, and uh, the guests knew the people who ran the show. And that's what I found interesting about that show, because it was like you went to visit them in their home and, and just had a gay old time. I mean, if you think about it, Hee Haw was um, probably the most massive exposure country music ever got. I, I enjoyed all the characters and stuff, but I was a young kid and I, I wanted to tune in and see Merle Haggard sing. I wanted to tune in and see the greats of country music do that and it was a great opportunity for performance too it you know it had a profound impact on me love t haw always because to me it was a perfect blend of great country music humor you know and the gals running around in their little outfits and it had a little bit of risqueness uh and it just made you feel good to watch it first time i did he haw i got to salute bartlesville oklahoma my second time on Hee Haw was in 1985. I got to perform live with the Hee Haw Band and they were fabulous. I think I did about six Hee Haws, Hee Haw shows. I, I remember doing some lines, so I don't know if it was the cornfield or it was the board that slapped somebody, you know, <laughs> that reached up and whammed you, you know. I think it was that, you know. So that's the key, I think, to Hee Haw. It was so variety, so much variety was packed into that with great talent and good timing. Misty, have you always been such a ding-a-ling? Ding-a-ling? I'll have you know that in high school I had the highest IQ of anyone who took seven years to graduate. And Hoyt was a great guy, a great songwriter, uh, 
laid back, uh, in some ways, Hoyt Axton reminded me a little bit of Roy Clark. But Roger Miller said, I will never do that show. There will be a cold, cold day in Hades when, uh, when I do that show. I don't know where, where it happened. I, met, I think I was with Roy and I bounced into him at some hotel. And with Roy and my persistence, he decided to do he decided to do he all. Sooner or later, he showed up. He wanted to do a fiddle tune, just him and I. And uh, so we were running through rehearsal, him and I playing fiddle. And I looked over my shoulder and I said, I wonder how cold it is in the 80s now. They were all such great musicians, such great talent, such great people. When, when I first was uh, hired by Buck and they took me to Hee Haw, they wanted me to play an electric blue fiddle. I thought, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know about this. And I really was hesitant to play that blue fiddle because it was different, really different. Lo and behold, I started getting letters. The girl with the blue fiddle, addressed to the girl with the blue fiddle. And more letters, the girl with the blue fiddle. <laughs> and it became a trademark because blue shows up so well on camera, on TV, and it was different. It was catchy, it was electric, they could tune it however they wanted a little more. You can make it sound very, very acoustic also. So I ended up loving that blue fiddle. Hi, Ed and Thelma. It's nice to know so many of my Sooner friends are having a good time tonight. I'm from Oklahoma myself, you know, and I can tell you, the sooner I get back, the better. And you've heard that movie, Around the World in 80 Days. But well, we had something very similar that we wanted to do about Hee Haw. Uh, Cornfield County, it's like Mayberry. And so the gif of the script was that Buck and Roy were going to be on a buck wagon pulled by horses and stuff. And they were going to travel the south. And they were going to travel Cornfield County. So Mr. Gaylord had heard about this. His son from uh, Oklahoma City really wanted to get into the movie business. And so they came in and uh, they wanted to talk to us about this movie. And the bottom line was we didn't know that they were really big fans of Hee Haw. And Mr. Gaylord, who's got oodles and oodles of money, okay, um, made some overtures about the show. And he turned to the principal of our organization, his name is Nick Banoff, he's deceased now, and he said to him, would you be interested in selling Hee Haw? And this gentleman said, oh, you don't have enough money to buy the show. There was a pause, and Mr. Gaylord with his group left the scene for about 30 seconds as if to say, I'm going to go back in there and ask him. And if he tells me this, I'm going to ask him the price and I'm, I'm going to lock him in right now. And that's exactly what happened. They went, he came in and said, you sure you don't want to sell? He said, I told you, well, how much would you want? He said, uh, you know, X number of dollars. And he said, you got a deal. And he bought it to show. It was as simple as that. And the bottom line was that we were doing now under Mr. Gaylord's control, the Hee Haw Show. And everybody was responding very nicely. They were happy with the Gaylord family and so forth and so on. The gentleman, I tell you, what is so precious, so interesting, each and every time that somebody that I know meet up with the Gaylord people, they always say the same thing. Do you see Sam? Tell him we said hello. That's a nice feeling. It is an interesting tie to see how the Oklahoma connection to early day local country music productions sort of morphed in to uh, even having an influence on a national show like Hee Haw. Hello, Ed and Thelma. I got dressed up in my very best shirt here to wish you the very best for me and the buckaroos. <laughs> 
What he get? I got a hoot, Nanny. <laughs> that joke ain't nothing to crawl about. So he haw helped really not only entertain but educate a lot of people uh, that normally wouldn't listen to country music or, or that, you know. And let's face it, you know, it was a good, fun, humorous, entertaining show. But Hee Haw was as much part of our family, I hate to say it, as going to church. And that was just a, that was a, a must. And uh, you knew exactly what time it came on, what day, and you were in front of the TV when it came on. Uh, there's a joy and sharpness to it that's automatically entertaining. And so if the country was watching it either out of being entertained or out of, out of uh, like they were uh, at an exhibit. So this, <laughs> you know, they, you couldn't stop watching Hee Haw. It made a lasting impression on people. Families have grown up. Grandparents, parents, and kids. So we've had th three, going on four generations of uh, people who have kept Hee Haw alive. Just old time America, it was truly an American show. As corny as it was, it, it really mattered. It really mattered for this music's history and this music's place. But it was fun, you know, I, I think everybody shares that, that feeling that you really could just for that hour, you know, forget about the news, forget about all the wars or whatever's happening, you know, and just uh, kick back and take a trip to Cornfield County. I can walk down the street in Dallas or more than that, New York City. I won't go half a block, but somebody will say, I'm a picking. Well, I'm obligated to say, well, I'm a grinning. Well, good night, Mr. Owens. Good night, Mr. Clark. And good night, everybody else. And we'll see you next week on...